and one is Skip Atwater. Skip Atwater was the gentleman who established the Stargate uh, unit of the of Army Intelligence to use psychics during the Cold War to spy on the Russians in Eastern Bloc countries. And <laughs> that, I think some congressmen found out about it and they thought, you know, they almost went crazy. But apparently it actually worked. Now, when I talked to Skip, he was uh, the head of the Monroe Institute. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm talking with Stephen Holly Martin, and he has written books, research, used to have a podcast, done a lot of the same research I have, and has been very motivated and inspired by a lot of the same people as I have. So I'll let him introduce himself. Well, hello there, Liz. I'm Stephen Holly Martin, as you just said, and I have been interested in the paranormal and near-death experiences, reincarnation, all those sorts of things for a long, long time. Spent most of my career as an advertising executive. But while I was doing that, I wrote books and studied and had a near-death experience when I was about 15, uh, 25 years old. So, and that kind of woke me up to this whole idea that the mind is not the brain, that the uh, your consciousness and your mind really exist somewhere else, and that your, your brain is a receiver that integrates it with your body. So, yeah, I've written a bunch of books, and anybody who wants to know about them can go to my website, which is shmartin.com. So there you go. And that will be in the show notes, too. So everyone can just link to it and see it there. Wow. So you had a near-death experience. I would love to hear about that as much as you're comfortable sharing. Well, I'm I'm comfortable sharing. It wasn't really a very spectacular one. I was very ill. And I was, but I was at home and in my apartment, I lived in, I was a bachelor at the time. I was about 25. I was working at an ad agency in Baltimore and shared an apartment with two other guys. But I was, it was a Saturday night and I was really had a terrible case of the flu, I guess. But anyway, I heard the, some people come in downstairs. It was a two, two floor apartment with bedrooms upstairs. And I heard some people come in and after a while, there was obviously a big party going on down in the first floor. So even though I was very sick and I didn't, I, I thought, you know, at 25, you don't stay in bed if you can help it, if there's a party going on downstairs. So <laughs> I, uh, I got up and I put some clothes on and I went down and I, I had a couple of drinks and had something to smoke, and I just started feeling like I was going to pass out. So I am practically knee-walked back up to the uh, second floor, back into my bedroom, flopped down, and the bed was, it was like it was spinning around. It was like I was on the blade of a helicopter that was, was taking off. And suddenly that stopped, and I felt okay. And I looked down. And there was my body on the bed. And I have to tell you that I was raised in a very scientifically minded family who bought into the science that's still taught today that nothing exists except material substance, scientific materialism, I call it. And that's what I'd certainly been taught in school. And as I was looking down at my body, I thought, wait a minute, that's my body down there, and I'm up here, and my brain is down there. You know, how could that be? And, and this, it was not a spectacular near-death experience at all. It was uh, really all I did was hover there up at the ceiling for a while and think about uh, the fact that I was not my body, that I was my consciousness. And at some point, I just sort of blacked out, and the next thing I knew, it was the next morning. I didn't go through the tunnel. I didn't have a past life review, any of those things that uh, most of the big times near death experiencers have. I, I just, but what it did is wake me up into the idea and to the reality that we are not our bodies, that we are our consciousness. And what it did is start me off on a journey that I've been on ever since. And one of the things I did was join the Rosicrucian Society or organ, uh, Rosicrucian Order, I guess it's called, which is a society of uh, kind of mystics who, who study metaphysical law. And I went through all their courses and made it from a novice to an adept. And I can tell you that the Rosicrucians do pretty much know what's, what reality is. But I continue studying it and reading everything I could. And as you mentioned, I had a podcast for about three years back in the early 2000s where I interviewed well over 100 people from metaphysicians to theologians to medical doctors to those who are uh, 
studying the paranormal to uh, researchers like the people at the University of Virginia in, in the uh, Division of Perceptual Studies that have been studying that this whole thing for about 60 years. I interviewed a bunch of people who were who are part of the Association for Research and Enlightenment down to Virginia Beach. Uh, that's Edgar Casey's. Uh, Association. Anybody who doesn't know Eddie, Edgar Casey, he was a paranormal, a psychic, I guess you would say, who lived back in the 20th century, mostly 1877 to 1945, who did readings and so forth every day for many, many, many years. But anyway, that's my story and how I got started, uh, Liz. And let's go back to you and see what you want to talk about. I relate when you say we're uh, raised in a very science minded family. I always thought there was absolutely no such thing as afterlife consciousness was created by a brain i still have days i guess because i was so raised that way where i'll start to think that again and get really worried and sad you know because it was grief that brought me into this research although i'd say i'm about 90 percent convinced but so to clarify it had never crossed your mind that there was anything like an afterlife until you had your out of body near death experience. That is absolutely correct. It never occurred to me. I, you know, <laughs> I thought we were like robots, you know, with a computer like brain. And when, when we died, it was like you pulled the plug of the computer and that was it. I mean, that was what I thought. But I don't think that anymore. I, if you're 90%, I'm 110% sure that uh, that's not what happens. That is good. So I'm going to ask you a lot about that because I know we have a lot of grieving people who sometimes are not so sure who listen. And it just can be so helpful when you can get tangible data, experiences, information. So I'm curious, what happened Did, after your you went back in your body and were you just convinced the next day? Was it that powerful that you just knew or were you like something happened? I can't explain. I've got to start investigating. I would say I was closer to something happened and, you know, I don't understand it and I better, you know, I want to find out. And I, that's when I started investigating. I would say probably the, uh, the biggest thing, single thing that I did after that, that uh, got me going and really starting to understand was, uh, and it, it took a while before this happened, I happened to pick up a copy, I guess I was in a bookstore or something, of Life After Life by Raymond Moody, which I think came out in 1975, but it was brand new when I uh, read, and I read it, and I read it at one sitting. I mean, it was like I was glued to it because it, it explained kind of what happened to me. As I said, I didn't have the full-blown NDE, but I had enough of it to realize that, yeah, that's what happens. It was after that that I joined the Rosicrucians. And I, <laughs> throughout this whole journey, I've had synchronicity after synchronicity. If people don't know what a synchronicity is, it's a, uh, that's a phrase that, or a word that was coined by Carl Jung. It's a, a meaningful coincidence, a coincidence that kind of corresponds with what, what's going on in your life in your head at the time. But, uh, you know, I would go into a bookstore and walk over to a shelf and there would be the book I needed. You know, those kinds of things happen all the time. And one of the things that happened was I happened to be looking through some papers. My father died when I was young and I happened to be, he was the son of a Methodist minister and he had two brothers who were Methodist ministers. But he went to the Unitarian Church, which is a, not a Christian church. It's the idea of a Unitarian Church is it brings all spiritual churches and so forth together, everybody together. But he died when I was seven years old. My mother was not religious at all. But I happened to be looking through a bookshelf where there were some books, I guess, that he had had. And this was when I was in my 20s or 30s. And it was at my mother's house. And I came across a book that had some a pamphlet in it for the uh, Rosicrucian Society. And I read about that. <laughs> And that was one of that was a synchronicity because I, I, I joined that society and I, they have courses, at least they did back then, which was a long time ago, that you could take. And they believe, you know, in reincarnation and, and all of that and metaphysics, the basic metaphysical law that they teach is absolutely true is that like attracts like. And of course, that's where the idea of the uh, law of attraction comes from, because like really does like you attract to yourself what who you are and what's in your mind. And uh, so anyway, that, uh, that kind of tells you about that. And I'm so sorry if I mispronounced this, but I've never actually heard of the Rosic... R Rosicrucian. It's 
Rosicrucian. Uh, it's R O S I C Cruzy. R O S I C I R Rosy Cru. R I R O S I C R U C I A N Society. It's located in uh, San Jose, California. It's supposedly a tradition that goes back to ancient Egypt, but there were a number of Americans, famous Americans like uh, Franklin. Uh, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, people like that, a lot of our early fathers uh, of the country uh, were not only Masons, but they were also Rosicrucians. Uh, and they, uh, anybody who knows about Thomas Jefferson, for example, knows that he created his own Bible by doing a cut and paste. He didn't have a computer, but he actually had scissors. <laughs> and he he took the parts out of the Bible that he thought were true and pasted them all together. And in fact, he could probably still buy a Jefferson Bible. But uh, he was a, a Rosicrucian as well as a Mason. And they know what's going on. That's all I can say. Do they have, is it more like a religion? Do they have people involved, such as people who study the evidence, such as Dr. Tucker from the Division of Perceptual Studies, who we can talk about a little in a little bit, but... Is it more, what, what is it based on? How do they get their information or draw their conclusions? Well, it is not a religion. In fact, what they say is that you, you can be of any, any religion or no, no religion and be a Rosicrucian. And uh, they encourage you to, you know, follow whatever path in that regard you want. But according to what they say, it's information that's been around for 2,000 years and that has been passed down. And I will say that reincarnation is part of it. The whole idea that everything is energy, is uh, that energy is what the universe is, and that consciousness comes from that energy, and that we, uh, and that consciousness creates our reality. There is nothing really solid, and all is one. We're all part of one just thought, or whatever that word is, that we, we think we're separate, but we're not separate. We, we have that belief because we have bodies and other people have bodies. But really, even quantum physicists will tell you that really all is one because it's all energy. Everything is vibration. Some things are vibrating at a higher frequency than others, but one vi it doesn't like one vibrating thing doesn't end before another one starts. It's sort of they all blend in together. And that's what one of the first things they, I remember from one of the first lessons in the Rosicrucians was uh, John Donne's poem about no man is an island. Uh, each person is a part of the continent, a piece of the main. And that was something that apparently John Donne understood uh, when he lived, however, I, what, 17th century? Their, I, their belief is that the average uh, life on Earth and not on Earth, uh, but the one personality life uh, lasts about 140 years on average, where you might spend 70 years here, then you'd spend 70 years in another dimension before you return. Now, they are quick to say that's on average, whereas uh, the University of Virginia has been studying reincarnation, children's memories of past lives since 1962, and they have over 2,600 cases that they've studied, about 1,700 of them the last time I looked, have been what they call solved, where they actually found a an individual that uh, matched up with with the what the child was describing in terms of his you know present uh, name and siblings and parents and where he lived and what his job was and things like that and how he was killed or how he died, but their what they've learned is that uh, most of their I would I've forgotten the percentage but. Certainly well over half of the children who remember a past life had their life cut short. And so they they tend to come back fairly quickly. As I recall, I think it's something like 15 months, but on average, between the death of the uh, in the previous life to the birth in, of the current life. Uh, so they're kind of a, they're a different sort of situation where they their life was cut short. So they come back quickly because, you know, they didn't do what they wanted to do or what their life plan was. They're usually either killed in an accident or killed in war or sometimes murdered. Often they have uh, often they have birthmarks or some sort of deformity that uh, corresponds with their birth. You know, one that comes to mind is where there was a school teacher who was writing 
his bike to school was shot in the forehead and a picture of the corpse in the morgue showed that and uh, it had an exit wound in the back of his head and the child was born with a uh, birthmark on his forehead that could have been a bullet hole with the splattered uh, birthmark on the back of his head. Those kind of things. Born Children born with no hand who had a hand cut off. Things like that that are just no way you could possibly uh, explain it in any other way. So it, it's very convincing stuff. There. But back to you, Liz. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, I believe um, if anyone wants to read that, that was actually Dr. Ian Stevenson who covered that case, not Dr. Tucker, right? I know Dr. Tucker, yeah. if everyone listening, took over as Ian Stevenson's protege and has taken over his work since Dr. Ian Stevenson's death. But I definitely recommend reading all about the birthmarks in that case, because Dr. Ian Stevenson has written wonderfully about that. I did not. I never actually spoke to him. He died in 2007, as I recall. And he uh, uh, was actually graduated first in his class from McGill University, which is sort of Canada's Harvard Medical School, and uh, was the head of the psychiatric department in the University of Virginia School of Medicine. And he somehow or other got interested in, in reincarnation and started studying it. And his first book was called 20 Cases Suggestive of, Reincar of Reincarnation. But he wrote a whole shelf full of books after that, a couple of them that are huge in terms of length, you know, a thousand pages of uh, case histories and things like that one I just described with the birthmarks. And I think it's called something where biology, biology and reincarnation intersect. And uh, he started that back in the early 60s. And somewhere along the line, not long after that, I think it might have been in 67, got a grant from the gentleman who invented the Xerox machine, who was also interested in reincarnation. Big pot of money to go ahead and study that which he did for the next, you know, 60, almost 60 years. And uh, they formed the, a separate division of the medical, medical school called the uh, Division of Perceptual Studies. You can Google that and find out all about it. And there are a lot of videos of uh, different people from, the, from that uh, Division of separate, uh, Perceptual Studies on YouTube talking about things that they've learned and, you know, case histories they've studied. They even have panel discussions. It's a few years ago, I was shocked to see that the uh, University of Virginia magazine that they send out to alumni, my daughter's a graduate, so we get it here, actually had a cover story on this whole uh, division of perceptual studies and what they were doing. And they got a huge backlash from from uh, alumni saying, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> we're putting this stuff out there. You know? It's like oh, people yeah. just refuse to believe it. But for thousands of years, people believed it. It was only... In the 19th century, when people, when scientific materialism came along because of Darwin and all that, it really started back in the uh, age of uh, enlightenment, you know, with uh, Thomas Hobbes, who said nothing existed, but, the, you know, if God created it, then uh, that that's all there is, is what his argument was. So if God created the universe and the universe is matter, that's all there is. He didn't say where God was. But anyway. And none of this research requires a belief in God. I mean, if someone believes in God, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's just you cannot. I still don't believe in God. And I think this evidence is so strong. And, you know, if a school is reputable as the University of Virginia is putting it on the cover and has this whole department, you've got to consider it. You know, I mean, there's something really substantial going on. Yeah, exactly. Well, the thing about God is it's my what I have come to believe is closer to what the Hindus believe, which is there is a, a force. I think they call it with, it comes from Veda, which if you do a small stretch, you can translate as consciousness. That, and if you talk to a quantum physicist, he'll tell you that there's the unified field, which is energy and that everything comes from that. And uh what we are, we're like the little doll at at the very base of one of those, one of those uh, Russian dolls, the nesting dolls. I've forgotten what they're called, but anyway. And so here we are down here, and we think we're separate because we have our own uh, ego, our own conscious mind. We have our own memories from the time we were you know, little until now. Uh, we also have a subconscious mind that I believe contains all the information from previous lives. But all of that kind of blends into a what Carl Jung called a collective consciousness. And 
So I think they're really, in fact, the School of Metaphysics in in, uh, in Missouri been there several times for uh, uh, seminars and weekends, and they believe that there are seven levels of uh, consciousness up to the whole, which is, and all of it, what this whole life thing is about is evolution, that we are, uh, we as individuals are evolving and to higher states of consciousness, and that the all, the everything, God, if you want to call it that, but it's not, you don't have to. Like I said, the Hindus don't believe in God. They believe in Brahman or whatever they call it, which is not God. It's more of a force, is also uh, evolved. And that the way the overall evolves is through all its pieces that it's put out there. You and I being pieces, but, you know, the trees and the flowers and the uh, chipmunks and the <laughs> everything else is all part of it. It's like... It's really very much like uh, what my mother and father would have called pantheism, which they kind of sneered, you know, they didn't believe that. But it's really, that's what it is. It uh, is very much closer to that than the Christian idea of an anthropolog anthropolog what's the word? Um, anthropomorphic or anthropo anthro uh, anthropo uh, a, a human-like God. Yeah. You know, you <laughs> Sistine Chapel. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci's, you know, painted this man with the white beard, you know, and he's pointing his finger down. Well, that's not God. God is not like that. If there is a God, you know, it's more like a, an intelligent force that's evolved along with us and because of us and because of everything else. I could believe that. I have a very hard time believing the God of religious text as literally it's interpreted. Again, absolutely no disrespect to anyone who does, just my evidential think, take. I think that Jesus knew Jesus, if you read the Bible and you know what I know and what you know, you could see that Jesus knew what he was talking about. But he didn't. I mean, he called it his father. Well, it is. It's all uh, that that force is where we come from. So, And like the game of telephone, this was thousands of years. Who knows how it's in translation, texts have gotten around the culture of the time. You know, it was uh, the idea of a sacrifice, uh, wiping away your sins. I mean, that people were still sacrificing lambs on altars and stuff back then. So, yeah, I mean, it, it uh, it's filtered through there, through the people that lived at that time. It's through what they understood and thought and knew. What he said is filtered through them into this religion. But if you just look at what he said, he said one time some... Uh, Jews came to him and they were going to stone him because he, he, they said he was blasphemous. And they said, well, why do you think I'm blasphemous? And, he, and they said, well, anyone who thinks they're God is blasphemous. And Jesus said, well, doesn't your law say ye are gods? And it does say that in one of the Psalms. In other words, he, he threw it back on them. Their own scripture says they're gods. So he was not thinking that he was the only one. I I just can't comment because I have barely read anything of the Torah, the Bible. I've been raised so secular. So I'm going to ask you, too. I want to back up a little bit. You had mentioned you just started having amazing synchronicity. Is there one that stands out to you that you just were like, oh, my God, what the fuck that you really want to share? Well, they're mostly the little ones, like I said, but it, it just happens all the time. I think once you realize that, you start seeing it, that it, it happens to everybody, but, every, but most people dismiss as a coincidence, but it's not a coincidence, it's a synchronicity. I have come to the conclusion that it's like we're all part of a dream, and each one of us is having our individual dream, but the whole thing is somehow coordinated because we're all part of what mind is. You know, Carl Jung said, the collective consciousness. And um, I will tell you one story that I dismissed and didn't didn't click with me until actually fairly recent. I was 14 years old. I was with some other boys. And I, I wanted to get across this highway that's south of, I live in Richmond, Virginia. And Route 1, which is the, used to be the main highway uh, on the East Coast before 95 was built. And this was before 95 was built. Route 1, south of Richmond, six-lane highway with the grass media. I wanted to go from where I was to the other side. And I guess I didn't look right or carefully enough. And I ran across and I was hit by a car in the middle lane. Middle lane. Obviously, I should have been killed like a deer uh, run, bounding across the road. Well, I was went up in the air, over the car. I looked down and remember seeing it. And I landed on the grass media and I slid to a stop. And all I heard all the cars screeching, screeching to, you know, putting on their brakes, scre tires screeching on asphalt. And I stood up and I kind of dusted myself off and I looked, my pants had a uh, grass stain on them. And there was a car that, not the one that had hit me, but a car that had 
come to a halt right there about six feet from me. And the guy looked over and he was like, you know, his eyes were wide. And he said, are you okay? Because I saw him standing up. I said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. And he, he stared at me for a while. And then finally he, he uh, beeped his horn because the other cars were all stopped too. And they pulled off. And I looked around my shoes. I didn't. My, I was just my socks. And I looked, and about 50 feet ahead of me were my shoes. And I went and got them and put them on. Well, I thought for 50 years that I was just lucky. And that I had somehow, the car must have caught me in mid-stride and just flipped me. You know, maybe it caught my foot or my ankle and flipped me up in the air. And I landed on the grass median. I've come to the conclusion that it was something much more than that. It couldn't have been. I, there was no way that a car coming 55 miles an hour hits somebody and that doesn't kill them. So, wow. You, you could say it was angels. You could say whatever. I don't know. I just know that I wasn't supposed to die and I didn't. And that's what I guess a lot of people who have near death experiences and some mediums have said as well is that we have our death dates. We might have more than one exit, not just necessarily one, but basically before we come here, we have a certain plan of when we're going to go. And that is some evidence, I think, that would back that up. And wow. And the fact you were barely even hurt, it doesn't sound like you were rushed to the hospital. No, the, the worst thing that happened to me were the grass stains of my khaki pants. I mean, really, it's, it's, it's incredible. Now, I mean, looking back on it, but, you know, after a while, I thought, well, I was lucky. Wow. And then I kind of forgot about it. But recently, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you what happened. I know you're not a churchgoer and you don't, but my wife is a very strong Christian and I go to church. And that's why I know all the scripture and stuff. And, you know, I have come to the conclusion because of that, that Jesus knew what he was talking about. He may not have been interpreted correctly. He was interpreted, interpreted through the minds of two thousand people that lived 2,000 years ago who thought of uh, God as an external being who's like a human. And that's not, I mean, I think that's wrong. But I think Jesus knew what he was talking about. Well, anyway, uh, the church that we go to had a series on, they, they tend to like four, six, eight week series on a certain topic. And they had one on this fall on angels. And there were other stories like mine where people, one of them, for example, one of the, one of the preachers at the church who uh, uh, gave a talk was, I think he said he was 12 years old and he, his parents were missionaries in either South America or Africa. Anyway, they, they went up this, on this mountain that was had a glacier on and you know just just kind of hiking and they're going to have a, a picnic up there or something like that and he went off from the group and came to an area where there was a crevice that was very deep and he started sliding toward the crevice and if he had fallen into it you know the thing was very deep that had been the end he's 12 years old well he said that something came up behind him and it was like it grabbed him and it took him back to the group and he looked around and there was no one there and it was that's the same kind of thing that happened to me and i don't i don't think the guy was lying so anyway and but i know there are other stories like that so you know those weird things strange things impossible from the standpoint of newtonian physics uh, happen so it's all part of this, this you know we really don't know a whole lot we think we know we think we know a whole lot more than we really do i think that quantum physics physics is the closest to everything but there's more on top of that that has to do with the, the universal mind that somehow has come about because of consciousness which has come from energy when you say we think we know so much and we know more than we ever have in one sense but to even fathom that now, when we look back on how much more we know than even 50 years ago, let alone 200 years ago, to even begin to think, wow, now is the time we actually really know almost everything in this vast universe, multiverse. I mean, to even think that, I just, I can't even imagine that. Well, we, yeah, we think we do, but we don't. We've got a lot more to learn. I think we will. I think what you and I are talking about here today will be part of the worldview in 50 years or so, maybe, maybe sooner, maybe longer. But I, it's, there's so much evidence, overwhelming, you know, people read my books because I've collected a lot of it together, you know, talk to, there's a woman very much like you, Liz, who, her name is Julie Beichel. Do you know about her? She's one of my favorites. Oh, I know her well. Ju Julie Beichel, she, her mother, 
committed suicide. And she was, she's a PhD in pharmacology. And she wondered about what happened to her mother. And so she started working for or with a guy at the University of Arizona, Schultz, I think his name is, who was studying. Gary Schwartz. Yeah, Dr. Gary Schwartz. And uh, found that she, she worked with him for a while and then they kind of parted company. But now when I was talking to her, she was studying psychics uh, who communicate with the dead using the scientific method, using what she learned as a pharmacologist with double blind studies and has published uh, peer reviewed articles about her findings that in fact, some of them really can seem to be able to communicate. Either they communicate with the actual individual who's passed or they're able to pull the information out of the universal consciousness, but they are either doing that or they're or they're actually communicating and she seems to think they're actually communicating with the individual because some of some of the things that are said that are very kind of personal to that individual and she founded an institute of the windbridge institute it's so interesting because i feel like when logical skeptical atheist science-minded materialist 99 percent when if we actually people like me or dr baishal actually start to really study this you begin to change your mind it's data it's not about belief it just starts being about actual facts and data and to me that's something that gives me the most comfort when i get my grief waves you know and it's even about emotion like if i take emotion out it's fat i'm reminded of uh, i i once interviewed a man who I, the reason i interviewed him is because his book he had a published a book called life after what did he call it uh anyway it was a book about reincarnation and the bible so i got in touch with him turned out he was a southern baptist minister who had set out to write a book debunking reincarnation as being non-biblical, in other words. And then when he started doing the research, he saw that all through the Bible, there's references to, they don't use the word reincarnation, but it's in there. For example, there's a one place where Jesus and his disciples come upon a man blind from birth. And the disciples say, uh, Rabbi, was this man born blind because he sinned or because his parents sinned? And Jesus says, well, it was neither. It was so that the work of the Father could be shown or something. And, and of course, Jesus cures him of his mind. But how could he have been born blind because of his own sin if he didn't have a previous life that where he sinned? You know, and there's those kinds of phrase, things that occur all through the Bible. The reason that reincarnation is not part of the Christian religion is Constantine. The Emperor Constantine wanted it removed. It was part of the religion up until five I think it was five, no, three, it was up till about 325. I think the second council of Constantine when uh, the bishops got together and removed it because Constantine told them to. And that really would just totally change Christianity if reincarnation were part of the doctrine. But he wanted it removed for, according to this Baptist preacher, when he did all this uh, research, it was because if you, if people thought that they would get a second chance, they might not obey the Pope and the, and the, bishops and Constantine himself. So they want, they removed it. From the little I know about religious history is there has been a lot of power moves, human made power moves over the years. And it's still in certain ways, in many ways, still used to oppress people. I mean, it's not the only use of it, not every division and every church or synagogue by any means, but some of them still do that. Sure. You know, it's human nature to, to want to be in charge and get people to obey. That does seem to be an infor unfortunate part of a big part of human nature. I also want to back up a little bit because there was something you mentioned that I've also read about too a lot. You said after your NDE, OBE, out of body. I'm curious how you personally changed and if you also started attracting different people, different things into your life. You mentioned the synchronicities and the spirituality, but tangibly, were you attracting better quality people or more people who are more you? Yeah, I would say so. It took, I changed over, it was a, over a period of time. I mean, it, w it was not like I had this often with, if you, you talk to people who have an NDE, they, they are an atheist and then they have this NDE and they're like, oh, they're completely changed. It took me a while. I really went about it from an intellectual standpoint of, you know, I, I, I needed the facts. You know, I needed data. And so I went out and gathered data. <laughs> and and again, like you, 
you say you're 90%. Well, I was probably, you know, went 50%, 60%, you know, on up. Now I've had been so long. I mean, I'm I'm in my 70s now. And that thing occurred back when I was 25. And I've been, you know, at it since then. That it's just so much data that I don't even, it doesn't occur to me that it's possible that only matter could exist. I've seen so much. So much has happened. Uh, I'm not a psychic, I, but I have, I'm very, I am very intuitive. I'm, if you know about the Myers-Briggs personality, whatever they call it, I'm an INTJ. So I'm introverted, intuitive, thinking, and judging. And so somebody who is an INFJ, introverted, intuitive, feeling, and judging or feeling and perceiving, it would be the other way, come to where I am a whole lot quicker because they would it would be part of their feeling. They would just feel it. I've got to think it. It's got to make logic logical sense to me. And uh, so it took me a, took me quite a while. But as far as the law of attraction goes, no question that I, I've attracted people to me that uh, think the way I do. I've got a good friend who's a head of a law firm who had a mystical kind of experience when he was a teenager. <laughs> and he and I share stories. Uh, uh, as I've told you, you know, I've interviewed uh, Jim Tucker, at the, who's head of the Precision, Division of Perceptual Studies a couple of times. I've been, you know, I know the people down at the ARE, the Association of Research and Enlightenment. So yeah, and these books, you know, I've written a bunch of books. The information it just comes, you know, I have no problem finding it. I read some of your books. I definitely recommend them. They're very informative, very, yeah, you really get an overview of this evidence. And I want to ask you about your podcast. You mentioned Dr. Jim Tucker. Who were some other standout science-minded or really some guests that really inspired you? Not necessarily pick favorites, but just in terms of some of the lessons you learned from a few that stood out. Yeah, a couple come to mind. One is Skip Atwater. Skip Atwater was the gentleman who established the Stargate uh, unit of the of Army Intelligence. They used psychics during the Cold War to spy on the Russians and Eastern Bloc countries. And <laughs> that, I think some congressmen found out about it and they thought, you know, they almost went crazy. But apparently it actually worked. Now, when I talked to Skip, he was uh, the head of the Monroe Institute. Have you ever heard of the Monroe Institute? Yes, I have, and I really hope to go there someday. Yeah, it's up near Charlottesville, and I, uh, I've i never been there. I've, I know where, where it is, but I have friends who've been there, and they've had, you know, they've done the, uh, they have this chamber they put you in, and there's a, they call it a hemisync sound thing that some people are able to leave their bodies and travel into other dimensions. And I've got, a, I know a couple of people, a couple of close friends of mine, including the lawyer we talked about, uh, who had the psychic experience as a teenager, has done that and has traveled into other dimensions. And so I would say Skip Atwater would be one. Uh, he talked about all about how he established that unit of the army intelligence. Uh, another one, quantum physicist who, uh, I think he is actually. I don't know if he won a Nobel Prize, but he's very, he's very well known. I'd have to look back in notes to see who. The name of the quantum physicist is Henry Stapp, and his book is The Mindful Universe. Well, those are two that come to mind, but another, who's the lady who wrote The Field? The author of The Field, her name is Lynn McTaggart. Well, The Field is, uh, what she's talking about is the quantum uh, field, the unified field. And one of the things she studied is the effect of emotions on things like water and ice, you know, where you, if somebody has a raging anger, it causes the ice, to, the water to freeze in a way that is, you know, like that, just the emotion coming through. Another one is uh, a fellow named Baxter, Clive, Clive Baxter. Anyway, he studied plants and how, you know, the idea of a green thumb is true, <laughs> apparently. He, this guy was uh, in his office and he was interested in this sort of thing. And he, uh, his job at the time was uh, lie detector tests, where emotions are what, uh, how they can tell whether you're lying. You know, they hook you up to this machine. Well, he started wondering whether plants would uh, really, whether they were conscious. Or. So he hooks, hooked up his uh, lie detector machine to a, a plant that was in the office, a ficus tree or something. 
And anyway, he started thinking about, I'm going to cut the ficus tree down to see whether it got a reaction to the plant. Well, finally, he got around to, I think I'll burn the ficus plant. And the machine went nuts. Another thing he did, this is good, he hooked the plants up, several plants up to uh, his machines, and he had boiling water, and he poured live shrimp into it, and the uh, plants went nuts with the with the lie detector machines. Just shows you that we're all, we're all one, everything. That's really what the quantum physicists say, the same thing. It's all, everything is connected. You know, we talk about entanglements of particles, you know, no matter how far away from. Nothing is real until it's perceived. Nothing exists in physical, what we would call physical form until it's perceived. That's the double split experiment was what I talked about, the quantum physicists mainly. And are you aware of the double slit experiment? Yeah, actually, I was one of the very first things, Dr. Jim Tucker and the double split were among the very first things that opened my mind that there was something else and to go further. But I think explain it because it is still just so amazing that I think our listeners should hear all the details. Well, light, physicists will tell you that light is both a wave and a particle. The particle is called a photon. If you have two very narrow slits, razor thin slits, and you shine a light through them, you will get a wave pattern on a screen where it's like, you know, light and dark, light and dark, where one wave overlaps another and, and there isn't one here, you know, and so it becomes a wave pattern. Now, if you shoot photons from a photon gun through the slits one at a time, you will get, even though they're shot one at a time, you will get the wave pattern. However, if you have a machine that uh, records which slit photon went through so that the researcher is able to know that, you get a pattern of dots on the screen where the photons went through. And what that boils down to is until you know, until a human, until uh, entity, human being in this case, perceives something, knows something, it's a wave. Until it's a wave, until he perceive, is able to perceive it. Once he perceives it, once he's conscious of it, it becomes a particle. So it's either a wave or a particle based on whether or not the researcher knows what happened or doesn't. And this is traditional physicists who study this. Einstein, Dr. John Wheeler. I mean, this is not you know, quote unquote out there stuff. So I mean, well, yeah. like your consciousness is interacting with these particles or, or actually it creates the outcome. Your consciousness creates the outcome of that experience. So experiment. But to me, that's just the most batshit experiment ever. If you had not had your NDE, do you think your life would have taken a completely different turn? Probably. Although I think something would have happened along the line to wake me up. Uh, I had another experience that was quite profound about 10 years later, but that was after I had studied with the Rosicrucians and so forth. But it was like uh, I was meditating. It's only happened to me once. Some people it's happened to more than once or apparently all the time. I don't know. But it was like my mind merged with the infinite mind. I could, whatever topic I thought about, I, I, it was like I remembered or I knew any answer to any question. Now, when I came out of it, I didn't bring all that information with me. I couldn't remember it all. But it was just a very, very profound experience. So a mystical experience, I guess it would be called. Uh, so I think probably something would have happened along the way to wake me up. But if maybe not. I still would have been done writing, but I'd probably just written novels, you know, whodunits or, or romantic suspense or thrillers or something like that. And I've written a number. I've, I've written five novels along with all my metaphysical books. But... I probably would have concentrated on that instead. And, you know, I did have a pretty good advertising career, so I enjoyed that. It was fun to create. I like, love to create. And advertising is a fun, creative industry as well. And You sound like me in the sense you like to do multiple things. You know, I, I really do feel like I need to stay busy or I go crazy. Uh, I, uh, I probably, you know, still work 40 hours a week, but mostly writing or editing. People often say about NDEs that they felt like realer than real. Did it? Did you experience that? Did it feel like it was just real or did it even feel like almost like this life was a dream? Yeah, I would say that the first thing I remember from that was when, and I remember kind of like chest swelling and I remember being up at the ceiling and looking at the plaster and the little, the fine little uh, cracks in the plaster and the, and the, <laughs> 
you know, the, the dirt or whatever collected in there. It was like very, very, you know, it's like it was, I was looking at it with magnifying glass. And then I looked down to myself. And the amazing thing was that I was, I'd been, I'd felt so awful right before that. And I was calm. I felt, I didn't feel anything really. I didn't feel bad. I didn't feel anything physical, I guess. And, uh, <sighs> I guess it was realer than real, <laughs> uh, more vivid, because I'd been kind of in a fog, you know, from being sick and having a couple of drinks, which I shouldn't have done. I'm sure, I think what happened is my blood pressure must have just really dropped, and that's when I went. <laughs> but it was, it was uh, a very vivid, very vivid experience. And the and the uh, mystical experience that I mentioned was even more, even more so. It was I, when I opened my eyes, I could see auras around the trees and the flowers and the grass. Uh, it was like I was halfway in between two realities. Very, it's hard to explain. That's a pretty good explanation. Can't lie, I'm a little jealous and would love to have experiences like this. They say these experiences can be so healing. You know, people have an NDE and they are healed so much faster than the doctors would expect. Now, you were sick, drinking, and smoking weed. All of this can make you not feel well. I mean, only at 25, you go out drinking when you have the flu. When you woke up the next day, were you feeling sick still? No, I was up for that. As a matter of fact, it was like I was better. I really, I you know, I woke up. I was fine. But I, and I will say that, uh, uh, yeah, that I, the main thing is that I am not afraid of death at all. Uh, and I think that has been the, even when I was 25 years old, it was something I worried about. You know, your, your life is going to end and you're not, you know, you're not going to exist. That was a troubling kind of thought, but I, it's, it's gone. I don't worry about it. Uh, I know that I always exist, exist and I, I, in a way it's changed how I relate to life and people. I know that there's some people, probably my family and so forth, that that I've probably been with many times that are part of my soul group. But, you know, there are other things that it just, I, I'm not bothered by things. There's really almost nothing somebody can say to me that's going to upset me, you know, it, because I think, well, that's their problem. It's not mine. I'm, I'm going to be around for eternity. And that's a long time. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I was going to want to end on what you just said because that was so beautiful. But I'm going to ask one more question since you said eternity. You think it's eternity. You think after our next, after the big crunch and the sun goes out and our planet dies and we have maybe another big bang and another universe, you think our consciousness continues through different iterations of our universe? Yeah, I don't, I think this is not the only universe, I don't think. I mean, it's, uh, I'm not, that does, the idea that the, sun will eventually burn out well, yeah i agree that probably happened but i i don't know whether how many more times i'm going to be back to this this particular uh terra firma anyway i mean i this could be my last time i doubt it though i still have plenty to learn but uh, i don't think that i will keep reincarnating here for i think that there's a progression that we go through and that uh, i'm probably better than halfway through it uh incarnating on this planet i think there are other planets and i think there are other realities i think that, that the physical this physical so-called physical reality i say so-called because it's not really it's consciousness but it's just one of many realities as jesus said in my father's house there are many rooms and that i, I think i know what he meant there are many rooms and we're going to go on to other rooms after we're done here. Well, that's a very, be not only beautiful and hopeful, but also spoken from a place of knowledge, experience, and well educated on the topic. So I think with all that, that can be very, very encouraging for our listeners. So thank you so much. Oh, I think we've had a great conversation. I've enjoyed it very much, Liz, and I thank you for having me on. I thank you so much, too. And where can our listeners find all your books? It sounds like not only do you write about this topic, but I think people would love, I love a good novel or fiction book as well. So it sounds like you've written a yeah. lot of different really enjoyable books. Go to my website, shmartin.com. Up at the top in the menu, there's uh, a, a tab for business books. I've written six business books. And there's a tab for fiction and nonfiction, which is where you'll see my novels and most of my metaphysical life after death, reincarnation uh, books. So you, you can 
you know, go to that page and click on any cover and it'll take you to the page on Amazon where you can read the reviews, maybe read the first chapter or two and uh, decide if you want to go further. To get more information on what the fuck just happened, go to wtfjusthappened.net. There you can order my book, What the Fuck Just Happened?, a sciencey skeptic explores grief, healing, and evidence of an afterlife. And you can learn all about how I came to conclude that there most likely is an afterlife. You can also learn about the early stages of my grief and the amazing, fascinating people I met along the way. You can also read about how much I harassed them trying to get evidence, see if they were cheating, and see if they were sane. There, you can subscribe to our newsletter. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. It makes such a difference, especially for a new podcast like this one. And if any of you have had a crazy what the fuck yourself, have any questions, feedback, or just want to say hi, reach out on either Instagram at WTF underscore just underscore happened underscore or email me at hello at WTF just happened dot net. And remember, you don't have to draw any final conclusions as you wonder.